Okay, we have five days left of this legislative session, and we have a lot to cover in those five days. We still have gambling, which at this point is full-scale casino gambling. We have medical marijuana. We have the transgender bill. We have both budgets that still haven't passed. And there's so many. But one that I really especially, you all know about the VCAP, the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. We've talked about that before. This is where young children are getting puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and re sex reassignment surgeries. We want to ban that until they're 19 because 80 to 95% of children who are gender confused, if they're allowed to go through natural puberty, will come out on the other end fine and they will come to accept their biological sex. However, if you start giving them these treatments, you can ruin their life forever. So we think this is a really important bill. But I want to draw your attention to another bill. You've probably heard at the federal level, they want to give what they call vaccine passports. They want to see that you've had the COVID shot and you can't go anywhere without showing your papers that you've had that. Have you all heard of that? So we had a bill that passed the Senate that was banning vaccine passports and it passed and it was a good bill. It would protect all of us in Alabama from the requirement of having documentation that we had a vaccine. Okay, so you couldn't, they couldn't stop you from buying something or selling something or employment. Okay, that's all good, right? So it passed the Senate, it went to the House and it was in the House Health Committee and two lobbying groups got a hold of it higher education, and the Medical Association for the State of Alabama is called MASA. It's a powerful lobbying group. Well, you know, this bill is good for some, but they wanted to be exempt from it. So they put language in there that as higher ed, they can withhold students from coming to school, being admitted, depending on their vaccine. Now, they already do look at vaccines for higher ed, but they want it in law. It's a policy right now, but they want it in law. And they've also added their employees. They want the right to be able to look at the employees' vaccine records. Okay, so that's not good. We want that out of there. The Medical Association, which is doctors, surgeons, podiatrists, healthcare workers, hospitals, hospice, um, you know those device, uh, medical device CPAP machine places, okay, th those are also considered in this, all of these medical people, it's not just about employment. They want to be able to screen their employees and keep them from working if they don't have the vaccine, but they also, with this bill, are allowed to deny you services. So if you want to go in and have a procedure done, but the hospital says you have to have a COVID shot, they have the right to keep you out. Do you think this is a good idea? We don't either, and so we're fighting tooth and nail. I really wanted that to be on your radar. And if you are not signed up for our emails, there is a sign-up sheet out there, and every week we give an update on these bills. And last Friday, we did have an update on this. And Curtis is going to talk a lot more about this and where we're going with this. But I just want you to be aware that if you hear the headlines that Alabama is ready to pass a vaccine passport bill that's going to ban passports, read the fine print because right now two big entities in the state are exempt and that could affect you and your employment. So with that said, um, I want to introduce you to Curtis Bowers. We um, went back from 2009. He wrote a movie, wrote and produced a movie, and it is phenomenal. It's called Agenda Grinding America Down. There are copies of it outside in the hallway if you haven't had one yet, if you haven't watched it yet. You can also watch it online at Amazon. Okay. Then he wrote another movie that's a follow-up on that called Agenda 2, Masters of Deceit. So he has been here in Wetumpka many times talking about the movie. Uh, when we were running the Wetumpka Tea Party, he was a guest many times. So I know some of you know him from before. But we actually, in 1988, were both going to Colorado Christian College in Denver at the same time, and we had no idea. We didn't find that out until January. So our, we probably ate in the lunchroom together. It was a very, very small school, so we probably ate in the lunchroom, probably crossed each other's paths before. So that was kind of a neat 
thing, but Curtis has been a state representative for the state of Idaho. And he has a great background, which we'll talk about tonight, on how he got to understand Marxism and communism. And it started back when he was in his college years. He is a father of nine children, and he's homeschooled those children. He was a teacher, public school teacher also, before he was a representative. He's got four grandkids, and he is just a wealth of knowledge. He has a weekly podcast called Agenda Weekly. I highly recommend it. It's $5 a month, and every week he sends out a great video, and then he gives steps, different things that you can do in your own family, in your community to help push back this tide. So thank you so much for being with us. Give him a hand. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Becky, for all you're doing to wake the troops. Um, I don't know what you want me to, what topic to go into Start, you, we'll go everywhere, but I just okay. want him to hear how you got started in this. How okay. did you find out about this? It, Marxism and yes. communism. Well, I grew up in a family that was very well in touch with things. So my parents at the dinner table, we were talking about current events and what's going on in the world. I was raised in a Christian family, uh, but my mom and dad were definitely uh, above the average in, in discussing important things at meals and things like that, so, which was a blessing. And so I knew a lot about Marxist-Leninism. I knew a lot about you know, the Cold War and what was going on. But in 1992, an older gentleman who was a good friend with my father, he asked me to go to a meeting that the Communist Party USA was having at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. He said he had been studying communism his whole life and written some books that had sold over 10 million copies. And he said, if I go, they'll know who I am. So why don't you go and see what they're talking about? Now, to remind you what's going on in 1992, in 1989, the Berlin Wall had come down, right? In 1991, in December, the Soviet Union dissolved. And now this meeting is six months later, the summer of 92. That's why he was so curious. He's like, what are they going to be talking about? We won. This is over. It's done. Well, so I went to this meeting. I went, flew out to Berkeley and, and went to the meeting. It was three days, 12 hours a day of breakout sessions and lectures and everything. And they said, we're disappointed that the Soviet Union wasn't able to take America militarily because America just has too much money. We can't outspend them militarily. But we're going to continue what we've been doing to, to subvert America from within. And for three days, they talked about the three things they wanted to do. They wanted to destroy our, our families. Um, they said, we have to break down the families. And the way they talked about families would blow your mind. They said the family is so evil, all it exists for is to brainwash children and to enslave women. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? So it was just, it was so much propaganda, it was amazing. But so they said, what we need to do to do that is we need to continue to encourage immorality so people aren't even getting married to begin with, and then encourage divorce and encourage, really continue to get behind the feminist movement to make women just discontent with marriage and motherhood. So they won't even want to get married and have a family. They'll want to go do something else. So that was for the family. Then they said, for business, we need to destroy the free enterprise system because it's so unjust and it's so evil and it's so unfair. Only the rich can make money and blah, blah, blah. And, but for that, they said, we feel, and this is 1992. Now remember, that's almost 30 years ago. So right now, this won't sound radical, but 30 years ago when they were saying, I was like, what are you talking about? They said, we feel the only thing that would be capable of breaking down the free enterprise system is if we get behind the environmental movement and create so much regulation and red tape, you uh, businesses will not be able to survive in America. They'll all move out to go out of, out of America. So it will collapse economically. And then the last thing they said, we need to destroy the culture of morality and Christianity in this country. It's so evil. And they said, we feel, again, this is 92, 30 years ago. They said, we feel the only thing that will finally extinguish any set of values or morality is if we can get Americans to accept homosexuality. And so 30 years ago, they knew that would just break down. But now you look back and you're like, it's exactly what happened. Um, 
And so I went to that meeting, though, but at the time, even in my notes, I, I, I had a little hidden tape recorder to record some of the sessions to give to the gentleman, and then I took lots of notes and I gave it to him. When I left, I thought, that's nothing I'm gonna have to worry about in my lifetime. It didn't seem like a good plan, didn't seem like it was possible where America was at that time, and I got on with my life. But then 16 years later, I happened to be a representative in Idaho, and some people started calling me and saying, hey, don't, don't pass this bill. It's gonna hurt my business, and it was environmental bills. And all, I hadn't thought about that meeting in 16 years, and I go, wait a minute. They were talking about using the environmental movement to hurt business, and these businessmen were calling me, this is gonna not help the environment at all, but it's gonna destroy my business. And, and so I, all of a sudden the light went on, I go, wait a minute. And I started, I got those old notes, I called the man that I'd done that for, tell, tell me all this stuff, because he, he had written a whole article in a magazine on it, and I went through all that stuff to remember it, and I'm like, oh my goodness, they've done this. We thought we won the Cold War, we didn't win anything. They just changed plans, obviously, because the list of goals they had accomplished were so radical to have accomplished that you've got to have some influence. So you obviously do exist, and you obviously have a lot of influence. And I wrote a letter to the editor in January of 2008 about that meeting as a representative. And um, on, a, on a side note, it's kind of funny. My, my wife w was expecting, and we were supposed to have a baby that week. And she, I wrote for the paper every month, uh, editorial piece. And she said, don't write on anything controversial this month, because I don't want you to be on the cover of the paper when I'm going into the hospital. And I was going to write on the, the abortion and stuff because it was the anniversary. And I said, okay, what if I write on that meeting I went to? <laughs> Somehow we were blinded to that was going to be 50 times more controversial. Anyway, I was on the cover of the paper the day we walked in the hospital. But people were protesting at the Capitol, demanding I resign just because I said, this is what they said at a meeting. Here's what's going on today. And I just said the last line, it's time Americans woke up. And that was it. So, but... It, the paper that had been there for 100 years, they said we had more response to your letter to the editor than anything we've ever published in 100 years. They got hundreds and hundreds of, of responses. One of the responses was from an older man, and he said, what Representative Bauer says is true, but it's nothing new. That was all written in a book in 1958. And I called the man, and I said, what book was that? And he said, The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen. And I'm just going to just briefly just show you this. because So I read this list for the first time in 2008, 50 years later. And I'm just going to read you a couple of them. But those of you that were alive in 50s America, think about what America was like then and how radical these were. And this is what provoked me to go, I've got to make a movie on this. I've never made a movie in my life. I don't know anything about it. But people have to understand our country has an enemy from within that is so much more deadly than any enemy we've ever had from without, and people need to wake up. But listen to this, thinking, and if you weren't alive in 58, think of Leave it to Beaver, <laughs> okay? Think of June Cleaver, sweet June, okay. And was this the one written into the... In the congressional record. It was congressional even read record. into the congressional record in 1963. So this was something our country knew about. And how often do you get a list of your enemy's plans to take you down and you still let them do it? It was unbelievable. But listen to this. Goal 17. You wonder why all the children want socialism today. The last poll I saw, over 70%. Well, listen to this. 1958. Goal 17. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism. Soften the curriculum. Dumb them down, push socialist ideas as if, oh, that's just and it's fair and it's good. That's why your kids and grandkids want socialism, because they had a plan. And they said, we're going into the schools and we're going to make, we're going to accomplish our plan. Now, some of these are just amazing to me, but I'm a Christian, so that's where I'm coming from. I don't know if all of you are or not, but anyone that has eyes to see knows morality is the fabric of any nation. <laughs> 
whether you're a Christian or not, you know it's good when people are moral. It's good when people are faithful in their marriages. It's good when people are just sleeping around with everyone. It's good, it's good for everybody. It helps everybody when people are moral. Goal 24, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. They knew if you can get a culture to be obscene, it's going to start unraveling <laughs> because obscenity, it doesn't stop there. It starts to you, you start with words, but then it ends with actions. And, and it's just goal 25. Think of 50s America. Break down the cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. We don't get it, but they knew, the communists knew, you push pornography, the thing's going to collapse from within. And in 1958 America, if you were to hand out any of the women's magazines today, you go to Walmart, the women's magazines that are right there at eye level of my boys, I have six boys, though any of those would have been considered triple X pornography and you would have gone to jail if you had distributed that. That's how much we've changed. It's been so gradual we feel like, ah, oh, it's, it's not been that much, but it's been huge and it continues to, to, to fall deeper and deeper with, with what you're even talking about, what they're trying to pass and what they're trying to do. Getting our children to question if they're the sex that they are? I mean, could anything conceivable to man be more evil than that? No, nothing. Nothing Hitler did was even close to that. Trying to twist the mind of an innocent child to question, no, you might be a little girl. I know you look like a little boy, but you might be a little girl. It's so deadly. And the little ones that might have trouble with it, they need help. You don't condone someone that's committing suicide mentally by overdosing on drugs or whatever. You, you help get them off that. You say, I'll, I'll help you. I love you. Let me, let me get you some help. I don't, I don't let you continue on that road. Well, they want to do that. Well, when you do what you want to do, it ends in destruction. And so, but on and on it goes. I mean, even in this list here, this is, again, 1958, goal 26, present homosexuality as normal, natural, healthy. That's their words from 1958. Could you think of a better three words for how it's pushed? Normal, natural, healthy. But why would you be against that? 27 is a key thing. I've been in the church my whole life, raised in the church. Infiltrate the churches, it's why they've changed so much, and replace revealed religion, the Bible, with social religion. <laughs> just, 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 and discredit the Bible. So just make it a do-gooders club. Just go, oh, come in, we're going to go feed the poor or whatever, and, and, and not get them focused on truth. Because they knew a book that's filled with truth that's opposing everything they're trying to push. If people believe that, they're not going to be able to sell what they're trying to sell. And anyway, just, it goes on and on. Um, I mean, here, here's one that I just saw. This is the last one I'll read. But this showed me, man, these people are just so evil, but so purposeful. It's so strategic. Listen to this. Goal 22. Um, eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings and substitute shapeless, awkward, meaningless forms. Our plan is to promote ugly, repulsive, meaningless art. And you'd go, why? Why? Because when you cannot discern the difference between beauty and ugliness, you are collapsing as a culture. You have to be able to say, that's beautiful, that's purposeful, and that's ugly, and, and, and they, that, what, everything that's gone up in every city in America since the 70s is twisted metal, and we're supposed to sit there and look at it and go, wow, isn't that amazing? What happened? Did something blow up? Did a building collapse? And we're not supposed to notice that, you know, David by Michael Angelo or some of these magnificent paintings at the Art Museum in Washington, D.C., that we're not supposed to be able to look at that and tell the difference. Like, this is a masterpiece. I could pass masterpiece. I could stare at it for hours. It's so amazing. And it's so in awe of the, the person's talent to be able to mimic the creator by duplicating. Art is only for the purpose of man imitating the creator. That's it. Anything that's, that looks like something the creator made, and it, that's good art. And if it does not, if it's man trying to be clever on its own, where it's just awkward, meaningless forms, is destructive and it is not art <laughs> and but they knew that our enemies knew that 
And that's why everything that's gone up in every town and every place in America in the last 40, 50 years has been that, because they knew how to take a country down. And that's what's happened to us. Um, so that's, when I read those goals in 2008, I just, my whole world flashed before my eyes. I remember calling my mom and dad and said, did you guys read The Naked Communist? <laughs> they go, yeah, we read it when it came out. It was a bestseller, it sold millions of copies. And I said, why didn't you do anything about it? And they actually had, and they go, you know, we had study groups in our homes. We'd, I said, I know you did, but how could everyone, when that's available, it was read before Congress. And then you let them check off everything on the list. I mean, everything from stuff on there from make, give China free trade status with America, which was unthinkable in the 50s. A communist country, we're not going to reward them by trading with them and propping them up so they can abuse their people. I mean, it's, it's, a lot, it's 45 goals, and there are 45 things, and they've accomplished all of them. And we sit there, what's happening to America? Well, I don't have time. What's, what time is the show on tonight? That's what's happened. We, we didn't realize that it, the price to remain free is high, whether you're having to shed blood at that moment in time or not, it's still high. You have to be committed. You have to be teaching the next generation, imparting truth and wisdom and discernment and understanding, or they will not survive in a world that only has one goal, is to deceive them and to destroy them and to pull them into their little scheme so they can use them, abuse them, and spit them out and wait for the next innocent young child to come along to do the same thing. That's what it's about. It's the children. If you have the children, you have everything. And if you do not have the children, you have nothing. Zero. And that's why God designed things where the family was supposed to be the most influential thing that existed because the parents were imparting the wisdom to the children and the understanding so they wouldn't be deceived by every clever sounding thing that comes along. And then truth would keep growing generation to generation as the generations grew. And, and so we have to get back to that. That's why I homeschool my kids. So you have a book out there, The Red Book. Is that the Naked Communist, or it's the, it, because it does have the list in that yes. red book. Tell us about that so people can It's really it neat. I, uh, when I finished the film, my dad, again, who had always been into this, he hadn't read The Naked Communist in about 50 years, and so he read it again when I, when I reminded him about it, and he was so blown away. He was a, a retired college professor. He started studying and he wrote the book we have out there called The Naked Truth, and it goes through each one of the goals and shows how they accomplished them. So it's, a, it's 50 years later, here's how they did what they did to accomplish these goals. So it's a, very, it's a great history of the last 60, 70 years, um, but yeah, that's out there. Okay, and that's a great one. I would suggest you get that, and if you don't have enough copies, you can order it off of your website, but it is a great, you can just flip through and, and look at one of those goals and yeah, each you're, chapter you're is just a couple yeah. pages yeah. on each goal. So it's very, it, the, the book's a small book, but it's easy reading. But it's powerful because you will have lived through a lot of it. You go, oh, I remember when that happened, but I didn't know that was part of right. what they were doing to slowly unravel the fabric so all of a sudden it would start collapsing from within. So as we're seeing this collapse happen before our eyes, let's fast forward to, and we don't have to totally get into the Great Reset, but let's talk about, COVID and how that is being used. Or we can go the way you want to go, but. Yeah, well, it's just, there's so much there. Just a, just a brief overview. Just like that, that list of goals from 1958. A lot of people don't know, but in 1999, some Chinese communist agents that were in America they accidentally left in their hotel room their strategy for taking over America. And our FBI got it, and I've read it, and it's called Unrestricted Warfare. And this is 1999, so 22 years ago. They laid out, this is how we're going to take over America. And they have been checking off that list. Um, like, you cannot believe taking over the institutions of higher learning, all the colleges and universities by donating to them, where then they can get on campus and they can be doing things and stuff, and by buying off the media, so media will never say anything negative against 
um, China, which they don't, because if you look at all the top networks, CNN, ABC, NBC, MS, NBC, all those, the funding they get from China every year and the, and the, the, the uh, money for advertising and stuff, they're not going to say one word against them because they don't want to lose the billions of dollars they get from China. So, but all the things going on are just exactly, you read that and you go, oh, this is all part of that. So, the Wuhan virus, here, here's a couple of key things. What, when you, when you, the more you study this, and the more you understand the enemy, and you've read their plans, it's easier than to see when they're doing something, even if they didn't have that written in the plan that you had read or whatever. Because you, you know the, the way they think and the way they strategize and, and the way they do things. And I've been studying this. My dad had me read my first book on communism in 1976 when I was 11 years old. <laughs> okay. He said, he goes, this is a big deal. You need to understand this. Um, and it's a book we have out there too, but it was called You Can Trust, You Can Still Trust the Communist. And it was written by a man, Dr. Fred Schwartz, in the 19, 1960, I believe. And, but he said, here's what communism is, and here's how they do what they do. But the more you understand them, then it's easy to see them. Well, I don't know if you remember, September of 2019, um, President Trump, gave a speech before the United Nations. You probably saw it back then, it was a great, incredible speech. But here's one of the things he said, and I knew when he said this, he was in trouble, because you can't say this. He said to all the leaders of the world and all the elites and globalists of the world, right there at the UN, he says, the future does not belong to the globalist. It belongs to the patriots. If you make your country the greatest country in the world, you do what's best for your country. And, and I said, he's in trouble. <laughs> you cannot say that at that level. Three months later, in Wuhan, a little virus got out or was let out. And then that could be under dispute. Did they do it on purpose or not? I think they did just from knowing them, but I couldn't prove that, so I wouldn't say, oh, yes, they did. But I can prove this. When it was out, they didn't do anything for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the few doctors they had that knew it was out and knew it was a problem, when they said, tried to warn the world, they were reprimanded and imprisoned. And so you realize, and they had the, the, the Chinese New Year, which has millions of people from all over the world there. And they went ahead and had that celebration in Wuhan, where it is. And hundreds of thousands of people were there from all over the world, and they let that go on even though it was already going, and everybody fly back to their own countries. Okay. I also know this. In April, May, when our stock market started crumbling last year, they had cartoons in the communist Chinese newspaper in China laughing about our collapse of our, our, our economy, making fun of it, um, that oh, the American stock market's collapsing. So... And I know what they want to do. They, their goal is to take America down by 2030. It used to be 2049, and they said, nope, we're on faster track. Now it's 2030, they think they can take over America, even militarily, they think they're gonna pass us up. They're building their military at the fastest rate anyone has ever built a military in the history of the world. Their, their Navy is already far superior to ours. They're building a fleet of these deep water nuclear submarines that are so, where those can come right off our coast to launch nuclear weapons. And I'm not saying all this to scare you, I'm saying to awaken you, we are at war. Okay, we have a cultural war going on, which is just as deadly because it's destroying the hearts and minds and souls of our children. And if we lose all our children, it doesn't really matter anyway. But, um, but I'm telling you, so COVID, was part of this plan. But the elites, who are the, the masterminds behind these things, that, that's something too that it, you have to have studied enough and read enough to understand. Even the Stalins and the Lenins and the Castros and, and, the, and the leaders of China today, they still get a lot of their direction from the, 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 George, the George Soros types, the Bill Gates types, the Rockefeller family for the last 100 years was the single most influential family in the world and built working toward a one world government system. But so, so they use everything. The World Health Organization 
is, is run by a communist. Tedros is a literal communist. It's not even, uh, he was a member of the Communist Party in Ethiopia before he, they picked him to run the World Health Organization. I don't know if you know that. He was literally a member of the Communist Party there. So they, all these groups, almost every single global group, you go, oh my goodness, they're, they, they're a, a communist, literal communist, not just one that's in philosophy. They're literally, no, that person is a, literally a member of a communist party in some country or another. Because so, they know it, they have a goal. They, here's the goal, if you didn't know. Here's the goal that was stated in 1920, 100 years ago. Here's the goal, and then I'll tell you who said the goal. First, we will take Eastern Europe, then the masses of Asia, we will encircle the last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We will not need to fight. It will fall as a ripe fruit into our hands. That's Vladimir Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union. He, they had a plan, and they're sticking with the plan until they succeed at the plan. They don't care if it takes another 100 years. Um, they are satanically committed to accomplishing their goal. And so... So then you see something like COVID. Every crisis, like Rahm Emanuel told us, never let a good crisis go to waste. They are always are going to utilize that. But they saw this crisis. Oh, it's a global crisis. And those are their favorite, like climate change. Those are their favorite because global problems require global solutions by global governments. <laughs> and so COVID, oh, crisis. But you see, like the mask, Wearing the mask. Well, I have a lung disease. So I, I'm one that's more at risk for that, for having a problem. So I, right when this happened, like, whoa, I started studying masks, looking up medical journals and things. But, and I found, oh, they don't do anything. Zero effectiveness against the virus. Zero. Even when you're wearing the surgical mask, which no one's wearing, they're wearing fabric across their face, the holes in the fabric you're wearing is like a basketball net to a virus. So, but then you go, they know that. The CDC, they just came out with a report a couple of weeks ago, and their own report said the effectiveness of masks, they, they studied all the areas of the country that it's required and the ones that aren't. They said the mask helps you 1%. Well, let me tell you, when it's 1%, that's nothing. Statistically, that's not enough to even be a 1%. I mean, the wind can be warmer in one area, which kills the virus, so that's why the 1% difference was there. Or it might be a more elderly population in the one place. Or the, I mean, so it's zero. It doesn't make any difference. But they still tell you to wear it. And that's submission. They're testing everyone who will go along, who won't. And learning just to do things even when they don't make sense. They love just that blind submit. Yes, sir, what do you want me to do? Like a military, just submission. They want us to trust them like that. When whatever they say, stay inside your house. Everyone's on house arrest for two weeks. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, sorry. And that's, that's all it's about. Because I, I can study it because I go, I am, in da I am at danger. And studied 17 different studies. No effectiveness. Zero. Statistically, no difference enough to say it does anything. And so... That, that's a key thing. So you see, I know they know that, and they still have you do that. Then as you study the things that are effective, that medical doctors have studied now and know, December 8th of last year, I can't remember all the names, um, but I posted these videos on Agenda Weekly. One of the sharpest doctors I've ever seen, he was testifying before the U.S. Senate and he is with a practice that's one of the most respected in the world. Just the 29 doctors at his practice, I do remember this, they've had over 2,000 peer-published papers, which is unheard of. And he says, ivermectin kills COVID. And I'd already studied that and knew that months before I heard him say that. But he testifies, so the entire Senate got to hear this. And you can go listen to his testimony. The studies in Argentina where they gave it, Argentina heard about it, so they started giving ivermectin to 800 healthcare workers that were right there in the hospitals just with COVID patients. And then they had 800 healthcare workers that were doing that also. They gave a placebo to, because they wanted to find out, does this really work or not? Does this help things? And the 800 doctors that got ivermectin, 
It's a two cent pill, it costs two cents per dose, two cents. The ones that took that, of the 800 doctors, that are just around COVID patients all day long, not one of them got COVID, not a single one. And of the placebo group, 57% of them got COVID. We know, but that's already been four months ago now. Our country's still, you keep your mask on, stay at home, don't do anything. We're going to have another set of lockdowns. They know, now have the truth. And I know they did before. So then you realize these people are evil. And that's what I, that's the main wake up call that you get in life that's not a pleasant one. When I was a representative in Idaho, that was my first wake up call before all this. I got in there. I ate Idaho at that time. 85% majority of Republicans in the House, the Senate, and the governor. This is like a dream come true. No other state's ever going to have an 85% majority ever again. And we couldn't get a, pa a piece of Republican legislation through there to save your life. And I realized, what's going on? I was so excited to be in there. I thought we we're going to change the world by changing Idaho and being an example. And you can do anything. And that's when I realized, oh, all these people in here, none of them belong in here. They all became a representative or a senator because they like the name tag. And that's what drove them there. So they're never going to, they don't want to lose the name tag because that was their motivation in coming. And so anything that might be controversial, which everything good is because the media is against us, so they're going to be attacking you. I tried to tell them, listen, guys, if they're attacking us, anyone smart knows, oh, that means they're good. <laughs> I've voted for people before just because I saw the media tearing them apart. I go, they got to be great. They don't waste their ammo. They're not, they, they don't have time for, for games. If they're attacking you, you are good. If they're promoting you, you are bad, period. And there's no exception to that. The higher up you get, at a local station there might be, because they don't have the vast network of information coming in to make sure they're 100% on. They're never pushing someone good, and they're always promoting those who are evil. And so, anyway, so COVID, just the whole thing, the lockdowns were to impoverish us. I've read articles written over the last 50 years. We have to take America down. If we want global government, we will never get it with America being strong. So it's something they've known. It's, oh, that's why everything's always against America on the global scale, as Trump found out. What did he find out when he first got there? He goes, every trade deal is totally against us. It's totally unfair. It's ripping us off, ripping off the taxpayers. Why is this? He didn't get it because he's been in the real world where you're doing things that are logical and make sense. But that's why, because America had to go if you want to, get, to implement a world government. And so COVID is just another scheme that they're using and gonna ride as long as they can and do passports if possible because they want total control. They know one more round of lockdowns if they could get them. Small business is done. They, they estimate oh, probably 500,000 just restaurants are done. They're not gonna be able to open 500,000. I used to be in the restaurant business, you didn't bring that up. I had three restaurants, I started and worked so, and it's such hard work. I did that for years, right when I got out of school. And, uh, and I just, I, right when I saw what was happening, I'm like, oh, that's so horrible. I know how hard they're working. And when you can't have your doors open, and you still have all these bills, you're always in a high rent place, because restaurants need to be where the people are. Um, anyway, so it's very strategic and purposeful. The amount of money our government has divvied out for COVID relief is $41,870 per taxpayer. And you got your little couple thousand, but, you, but you're in debt, $41,870 more dollars, and they give you 2,000 of it or whatever, and oh, that'll keep them happy. That would have been some real relief. I, I, I don't think they should have done that, uh, but, but I'm saying if you'd have literally given $41,870 to every taxpayer, that would have done way more than what they're doing. And we're just wasting it and wasting it, paying off friends, paying off people that helped you out in the election, all that. So, so COVID is a lot of smoke and mirrors. It's a real thing, of course. But it's, I, my family and I, we all had it last September. And we, all of us, the, all, my wife and I and all the kids. And it was not, I'm very thankful, it was not that big a thing. For kids, it's just nothing. 
in two days, they're like, Dad, I feel great. Are you sure? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it was about a two-day illness for anyone that's young and healthy. Um, it, for me, it was just about five or six days of feeling rotten, but I, that I feel rotten when I get the flu or whatever for five or six or more days even. So anyway, it's, and I could go more into that, but I, I won't waste time on that. But there's, uh, things aren't what they seem a lot of times because there is an agenda. That's why I call my films Agenda. I want you to know people are checking off a list with most things going on. And if it's something that just actually happened on its own, then they're still going to use it to accomplish things on their list and check off a few more items. Because they're serious about this. Because we really do have an enemy within our country. And, um, and they've been here for over 100 years and multiplying and capturing the hearts and minds of our children. I, I don't know if you saw that study too about our young people. 32% of our young people said they wanted communism. I don't know if you saw the same study asked about socialism, communism, capitalism, whatever. 70 some percent wanted uh, socialism, but 32% wanted communism, which of course they don't know what it means. They don't know what socialism means because they haven't been taught that. But the fact they've been brainwashed to think that's good. They weren't taught about the slaughter in the 20th century. They weren't taught about the mass graves and the gulags and the, you know, they weren't taught about any of that. The comment is, oh, that sounds good. You know, so anyway, that's where we are. So I want to ask you, as we know, the Bible tells us where we're going. We know there will be one world government. We, we know now we're beginning to see that. But when you think about how big COVID is and what a hold it has on our country, and I'm so ashamed at how many sheeple we have in this country, didn't realize we would cave so quickly, especially when you see the truth and, and everyone's just bowing down and, so how do, do we have a way, because we're being censored, so it's if you push back, you're cut off that way. What, and I know you've, you've given us some ideas, so how do we, the small numbers that we are, how do we push back against this? And is it possible to? Is it possible to make yeah. a difference? Well, I think like what you're doing is so valuable Make sure you're getting their emails so you know, oh, I need to call my governor today or I need to call my representative today about the COVID passports. I mean, you, that's a simple thing. Everybody can do that on every issue. Call them again. Call, I mean, it's just a simple phone call. And they just take a tally there for or against whatever. I mean, it's not like you're having to explain your point of view to someone. You're just saying, I'm asking them to vote no on whatever the bill is or whatever. Thank you so much and tell them we're voters and we're paying attention. And so they, okay, and that means something to people. It does, because they don't want to lose that title. So even the ones that don't really stand for anything, you put enough pressure on them, they will do what is right, because they don't want to lose their position. And so that's, that's a, a, a real good thing to do. Um, again, on all these things, Every person needs to decide what to do. I don't want to tell you what to do, and then you do it, and like, oh, it didn't turn out good. I mean, like, don't wear a mask or whatever. I live down in Troy, and I don't wear a mask anywhere, and no one seems to have trouble with that, and half the people don't wear a mask anywhere, and, and so that's good. Um, but, uh, but, but again, other times I've worn a mask in a certain place because I can see there's some older people, and they're nervous. I always carry one in my pocket, and I don't want to stress them out. I don't have time to teach them, hey, you know, whatever. I, and I don't want to stress. So I'm loving my neighbor by being kind and thoughtful. We're not here just to prove a point. Um, but then on the bigger issues, it's, again, it's, it's influencing just one friend at a time. You know, one, one family member, one friend, one person at church. When, where you just, a lot of these things don't have the big solutions. Like, oh, we'll just do this and it's all done. It's not going to ever be done because they're not going anywhere. And so, but how, so how do you have impact? You have impact by pulling one more person off their side onto your team. So they lose a person, you gain a person. Or a person that's in the middle, which is most of America. They don't have a clue about anything, and they can prove it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's very sad, but they just, they don't know anything about anything. They've been entertaining themselves to death for 20 years, and what's going on, I don't even know. And they don't vote, they don't do anything. So those kind of people, if you can kind of spoon feed them some stuff and wake them up and hey why don't you come to this meeting we're going to talk about things and maybe get their eyes open that's a, that's a huge thing to do of course reaching your own children 
and grandchildren, if you can, if, if they haven't already been captured by the, if it's K through 12 didn't do it, usually the colleges finish them off, almost all of them, um, which is so sad. Um, but, 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 but find other, maybe kids at church or whatever. I, we do need to be reaching, young, working to reach young people, even if it's just one. So then you've duplicated yourself, you know, and so someone's here to fight the battle for you. Here's what the other side understood. One of the founders of this whole thing, and I don't have time to get into, is a man named Cecil Rhodes. And he is the one that really set the elites on the path of world government back in the late 1800s. Have you ever heard of Rhodes Scholarships? That's Cecil Rhodes, and I don't have time to get into him. But he understood, he was a homosexual man, that in his own diary, he loved molesting young boys. And so he never had children, never got married. And he said, but he realized, if I want my vision for the world, which is world government, if I want it to continue on after I am gone, I have to have imparted that vision to those that are younger than me before I leave. And so that's what Rhodes Scholarships are all about, to get the cream of the crop of the world by giving them a free college scholarship to get them on board with your vision of a globalist, one world government, and selling that to them as it's what's good. It's a good thing for everyone. There'll be no more wars, there'll be peace, there'll be, you know, and so that's what his, his agenda was to do that. And then he influenced the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and all the key people. He was the guy that had the vision. He literally had a vision. He came up one night and said, a vision just came before my eyes. I'm sure it was satanic. And he wrote it all down. And in his own diary, you can read it. It's called Confession of Faith. And it's evil, but it's, um, it's how they're going to have a world government. And he was, and he, just wrote it down. He said it came to me just instantly into my mind. I just wrote it all down. So that's what's happening. So we need to realize, okay, I need to impart wisdom to some young people. I need to invest in some young people because then this thing will continue on. You need to be praying for our country. I mean, that's another key, a really key thing. Because a lot of times in life, when there's really not things you can do. You can pray. If you're a Christian, you can pray. And we act like, well, it's, pray. it's not just praying. <laughs> God can part the Red Sea. I mean, he can, he can do the impossible in, 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 in if he chooses to. And, and so, but if you look at world history and Bible history, you go, he was more likely to do that when his people were humble and before him saying, God, we're sorry. Would you have mercy on us? He's like, okay. And slaps their enemies out of the way and does whatever needs to be done. So that's important too. Um. Okay. When you think about this administration and what are, what's on your radar that we should really be watching for that you think is coming down the pike? Well, if they can get the COVID passports on a national level where they have that much control of you, and they've already, I've read all the articles on what they'll be like. It's not, it won't just be your vaccinations. It's everything about you. It'll be your education, your employment, your everything will be in that passport. So wherever you are in the world, they know who you are and everything about you. And that's supposed to be a blessing. Um, they're like, oh, it'll be a good thing for everybody. But when they get it where you cannot buy or sell without that thing. Oh, you can't go in Walmart. You might infect others. But here, I want you to, I, one of the key things to learn to do, and this is what Agenda Weekly is all about. I'm trying to get people to think logical with common sense so they're not deceived. For instance, the COVID passport. And this is, I wish I had, could sit down with the representatives to explain some of it in case they haven't thought like this. Do you understand how ridiculous it is to have it? Let me tell you why. Not just even the infringement thing. <laughs> if the vaccine is safe and effective and everybody that gets it, want, that once it gets it, why do they care if I get it or not? They're safe and they're okay. I mean, why would you care anyway? It's like, so I get COVID, how does that affect you? Not at all. Everyone that wanted the vaccine got it and they're all protected now and safe and good. And so I go out and I get COVID. I'm sick, miss work for two weeks. It's my problem. But it doesn't even, it doesn't hurt you. They, they love before the vaccine because they say stay in your house because you don't have a right to, to endanger others and stuff. But now with the vaccine, we need to turn it on them and say, no, there's a vaccine. And so get it if you want it. I don't. And I don't care if I catch COVID. It's fine. That's none of your business. And I'm not endangering anyone because now the, the vaccine's available to everyone. 
So we, we can't just sit there and play. The, they always want to put you into an argument that they have the upper hand in the reasoning behind it. And when you say, no, I'm not interested in debating in your foolish chatter, here's the facts. Um, and so, but, but that's, I mean, I really see that. That would take a step so large, so big overnight. And that's what they're wanting to do, the Great Reset stuff. They're wanting to use this to take steps so far down the road that it would normally take them a decade to get there or more of slow movement. They're wanting to, I mean, the Pope the other day, you know, said, we need to use this crisis to implement the, the new world order or, or, or it's going to be a worse outcome than the pandemic. I mean, I mean, he's a Marxist to his bootstraps. I mean, he's, he's an evil, evil man. Um, and people, I have some Catholic friends, they go, yeah, you're right. Um, and, but he, again, he infiltrated the Catholic Church. I mean, that's what they do. That's all they're about is working their way up at Auburn University and at University of Alabama and at Troy University. And they've been doing all this for a hundred years because they knew if you get to a position of influence where you're influencing others, and especially like a teacher or a teacher of teachers is the best. In the 60s, they primarily went into the teachers' colleges. Um, their, their goal is this, and they've written about this over the last hundred years quite a bit, we, want, we have so few loyalists to the communist cause. We want each one that is committed to communism over his lifetime to have been in a position where he can influence one million. So one to one million. That's their goal. So they go, we don't want to go into the college. We want to go to the teacher's colleges. Because if, we, if we're just a college professor, we'll probably just have thousands of kids over our career. But if we go teach thousands of teachers over our career, they'll teach thousands of kids, and boom, we'll hit our million. And if we don't want to just be at the paper doing whatever, we want to be in charge of the editorial section, because that's the most read section of the newspaper. And over our lifetime of that paper, we're going to pick the letters that get put in there and get rid of the ones that they, we don't want people reading. And over a lifetime, easily a million people will be influenced by what we did. That's what they do in everything, because they have a plan. They're, they're purposeful. They're just totally purposeful in everything. Um, and so, but that's, you know, that's what we have to understand. It, it's, 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 uh, I know climate change ha has been on the radar for a long time, but it is picking up again big time with this. So what are your yeah. takeaways from that? Yeah, that, that's the, that's the main one that's not going away. They were so thankful for COVID because it's another global crisis and gl they want things global. Because then you can't, as countries, say, well, we're going to do our own thing. No, no, this affects all of us. You have to do what we say. They want that power to control everyone, every country. So, but the climate change is just, is the ticket. And you, and they can't, I know when they struck on that in the, 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 the 60s and 70s, they realized, okay, this is the ticket. Because it's so grand, <laughs> we're going to save the planet. How can you get more grand than that? As a call, a movement, what do you, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're just saving the planet. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and that's why they'll never leave it, ever, no matter how much evidence, because you can't step down from saving the planet to some other little piddly thing without losing half your troops. So it's never going away. So we need to be, have ammo to defend because it, just like COVID and everything, is a total lie. The planet today is so much cleaner than it was 100 years ago. You couldn't see the sky 100 years ago because of factories and stuff. There really was pollution. And that's what the real environment is saying. Hey, we need to maybe not be blowing that stuff out or dumping the toxic waste into the rivers. And we started doing all those things that are good things that everybody wants done. But they've kind of baited and switched that and say, well, no, it's cutting carbon dioxide. Now, I know you're older here, most of you, so you know this, but you need hey to now, be... Hey, now, hey, now, Older. Did you hear that? Is he cutting us well, down? Well, I mean, you're no, not children. No, no. <laughs> Wiser. wiser, there you go. <laughs> well, you probably had some kind of education growing up. You weren't just brainwashed the whole way. The, the foundational premise, and we need to know these things, but then speak these things. The foundational premise of the entire environmental movement is that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. Do you understand how crazy that is? Carbon dioxide is plant food. It is fertilizer for everything that is green, and yet they call their movement the green movement. The amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere right now, if you don't know, is 410 parts per man. That doesn't mean anything to you probably because it didn't mean anything to me until I said, okay, that's what it's at. What are we shooting for? 
What's the point? What, what are we looking for? And I started researching, what's the optimum level of CO2 for everything that's green? If we're the green movement, what is it? Guess what it is? It's 1,600 parts per million. We're at one-fourth of the optimum level of CO2 for everything that is green. That's why greenhouse growers pump carbon dioxide into the greenhouses to double, triple, and quadruple the level of CO2 from 400 to 1,600 parts per million, so plant growth life explodes. An oak tree will grow to full maturity instead of about 50 years and 15 years inside of a greenhouse. It does, it, it, you, you, the, the forest just, it's incredible, it's fertilizer. It's a literal fertilizer. And a lot of people don't know this either. When carbon dioxide hits 150 parts per million, which we're not that far off of that, everything green dies. You're, you, it dies. Everything cannot, when it's below 150 parts per million. And they call themselves the green movement to cut the level of carbon dioxide, which hurts everything that is green. Here's an amazing thing, the way God designed the atmosphere. Every time you double carbon dioxide, so if we could get it up to 800 parts per million on, on the whole earth, plant growth efficiency increases 35%. What that means is if you have a tomato plant outside of a greenhouse and you put the exact same size one inside the greenhouse and you just double the carbon dioxide in the greenhouse, so you have 800 parts here, 400 parts here, it will produce 35% more tomatoes on the same plant. God made it so if more carbon dioxide was produced, we would have more food. I mean, it's just, it's, in, it's God doing what he does. But they've lied to us. So a green movement's cutting carbon dioxide. You should be giving tax credits to the corporations to produce more carbon dioxide, literally. I know that sounds crazy because we've been so brainwashed. It's a pollutant, it's a pollutant. It's the single most vital element in the entire atmosphere for life. And the more they have them, the more oxygen they produce, and so everything does better. Everyone lives off what is green or what eats what is green. Everything. All life depends on what is green. And you want the green stuff to be healthy, like they act like they're for, but it's a total lie. They are trying to cut carbon dioxide. And the, the bottom line is this. The amount man produces doesn't make much of a difference anyway but they're changing everything in the world. They're impoverishing the poor even more by saying you have to have wind and solar. You have to have all these expensive types of electricity, which they'll never afford to have. That's why, do, do you know, and, and as you dig in, you see the agenda behind this. Do you know why they don't want Africa to develop? They were not allowing them to build power plants there because it'll hurt the environment. You'll produce more carbon dioxide. You have to have wind or solar, which of course they don't have money for wind and solar but they want to pillage the resources of Africa. And they know if the people are in survival mode where they don't even have electricity, where they, have, they can't, do you understand when you don't have electricity, you don't have refrigeration. And when you don't have refrigeration, you cannot preserve food. So you are every day worrying about what am I eating today? What am I eating today? So you cannot build a business, you cannot be prosperous, you can't plan for the future, You're, what are we eating today? That's it. And they want to keep them like that. Like China right now, I have a friend that's a missionary in Africa, but he, is a missionary to all the missionaries. So he drives his motorbikes all over Africa, all the, all the countries of Africa, to, to help them out and bring Bibles to them and do different things. And he says, so many countries I'm going through, there's Chinese troops in them lined up just keep, with guns keeping you back. They're just pillaging the resources of Africa. And these countries can't do anything against China and their military. And they're just coming in and then exporting the minerals and the gold and the silver and the oil and the, just pillaging the country, not giving the countries anything. And they're scared to do anything because they'll say, you'll pay if you even report us. And, but he said, I've seen it all over in many, many, many countries I've been to. Well, that's what's happening. That's what the environmental moves, movement's doing. It's, it's keeping the resources off ground so they can pillage them all, the elites, to be richer and to have more power and more control. It has nothing to do with helping the environment. Zero. And I, if I had hours, I could go hours on all the points of it that are a total lie. And here's, here's the interesting thing, and this is important to know. Almost every time they're lying, a Marxist, they don't just tell you a little lie. It's always a huge lie that is the exact opposite of the truth. Do you know why? It's brainwashing. When you, when you do the opposite, then it's hard for the mind to come back. When they really believe this, it's hard to come back to this. If you're told this, and then someone tells you this, you're like, oh, okay. 
but you, 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 you talk to young people about the environmental movement that are really into it and ask them what's going on. They don't know anything. But they will not listen to you when you tell them, well, let me show you the facts of this stuff. They'll put their fingers in their ear, literally, get away from me. Because they've been brainwashed and they cannot accept something that's different than what they've been told because they weren't educated by understanding things. They were educated by being indoctrinated. Where you're just told, this is the way it is. Okay. They don't explain to them about carbon dioxide and all the deep things. They just say, there's too much of it and we're all going to die. Oh, okay. So I'm against carbon dioxide. I'll hold the sign, save the planet. I've gone to the rallies and gone to the young people. And I love young people. I used to be a teacher and I, I just love young people. And say, hey, what are you doing out here? Oh, saving the planet. What from? Oh, global warming. Oh, wow, thank you. I was, I was, thank you so much for doing that. How much has it gone up? Oh, I don't know. It's been a lot. Oh, you know, what's the optimum temperature? Oh, I don't know. But <laughs> they don't know anything. They know nothing. But they're just crusaders for the cause. In, in a blind way, it's so evil. They've been so used. And we've got to get them to be able to see that. Because no one likes to be used. <laughs> You're being used. These people are lying to you. Why does the Al Gore's have a carbon footprint 50 times the size of any person on the planet? Because it's all a lie. If he believed carbon was doing what it's doing, he's not going to have a footprint that's 50 times any normal person. You're not going to do that if you believe that was true. You would care enough to write yourself to go, I need to cut down the size of my house. And they don't. Flying all around. The it's a joke. It's all a joke, and their actions prove it. But the kids are just being indoctrinated by the evil Marxist professors to just to listen and just do what they've been told. Wouldn't you say, too, the other way to tell is if they try to censor you? If, it's, if you're telling the truth, they have to stop it. They will not allow you to say something different than their agenda. Yes, and that's why it's so much editing on the, all the social medias and stuff. They're, in, they're all in cahoots. I mean, it's just it's the way it works. But, um, and it makes sense because when they pull you into their little global internationalist club, that's, you feel pretty flattered. Hey, listen, this is what we're doing to set up a world government. Would you like to be a part of it? Yeah, I'd like to be a part of it. Who doesn't want to rule the world? I mean, it's the natural flesh, lust of the flesh, to be empowered, people that like power, that that's their weakness, yeah, they want to be on the inner circle. And so they're going to do it. But again, all of this, it's so funny, just one more point on the environmental movement that's funny, as I really dug in to study it. I go, where did this thing really start? <laughs> it's unbelievable. It started in 1883. There was a paper written called Dialectics of Nature. And the paper warned that free enterprise capitalism was going to create so much pollution, it was going to darken the skies and the earth would get so cool we wouldn't be able to grow food anymore and everyone would die. <laughs> Guess who wrote it? Karl Marx. Last paper he wrote before he died. And with Frederick Engels, the two guys that wrote the Communist Manifesto, set the entire environmental agenda out in their last paper together, Dialectics of Nature. And it, I saw that, I'm like, I cannot believe it. That guy was so evil. The damage that has been done. And he was in 1999, um, the BBC over in, in London had a survey. Who was the most influential person? Not of the last hundred years, but of the last thousand years. And they said Karl Marx came in number one. The most influential person of the thousand years is poison. Um, but that's where we are. Okay, we have some questions. Lori, if you will get your microphone ready, and Jan, um, I see Margaret's already got her hand up. We're going to spend a couple minutes before we end here with questions. Margaret, thank you for coming from Birmingham. And there's a whole group of us here from Birmingham. Can you hear? Um, first of all, Becky, I want to say thank you so much for introducing me to Curtis Bowers. And Curtis, I want to say thank you for your, your weekly agenda, your movies. Um, it's helped my husband and I educate our family and it, it's educated myself I'll have to be honest with you I think the first time I got really interested in this um, was when it became very personal for me this past year when my son was being taught uh, critical race theory in a con conservative classical what's the next C Christian school 
And so um, my, my, my question is a little bit different because I saw this critical race theory coming into my, my church from the leadership. I remember going uh, several years ago and asking and talking to the leadership about a, uh, a, a comment that was made about the baker who was willing to stand up for his convictions and they were demeaning him saying just bake the cake and I said oh no you don't and I was coming at it from a legal perspective and and so so I saw this infiltration in my church come slowly in my knowledge but it was probably already there and then when this George Floyd brought the, the critical race theory out it just took over my church and so one question about that is do you know of any church in Birmingham area where you know the pastor has not bought into that and that's that's a genuine question we can talk about that later that, that maybe uh, something we shouldn't do publicly but I have been to group after group after group and everybody is just saying I'm so just frustrated and sad sad is really where we're at now sad that there are so many pastors in the Birmingham area that have just bought it hook line and sinker and they don't understand it and if anybody here doesn't understand it we need to yeah. so anyways thank that's you. my thank first you. question well yeah I'm sorry that's happened it's in the mid 1950s one of the top communists in America defected from the Communist Party. He, he'd been one of the founders of the Communist Party USA, but he saw what Stalin was doing, slaughtering the people in the Soviet Union, kind of disillusioned him. So he defected from that, and he went before Congress, the Un-American Activities Committee in Congress, and testified, and they grilled him, what have, what have you all been doing? And, what's, and he said, the number one thing we've been doing since the 1930s is going into the seminaries in the United States. We know the church is our number one enemy and that we had so few men, we had them all go get their theology degrees and then stay on as the professors. And, and, and that was, so starting in the 30s, so it's been 90 years ago, they started actively pursuing, they, again, they realized it's hard to get each church, but if we can get the pastors, then we get the church. And so they did that. Then in the 60s is when they really went after the evangelical church. Because, see, the other churches were so easy for them to capture because they have a hierarchy. You know, and so all they had to do is work their way up in the hierarchy, and then boom, everybody's got to do. But the evangelical church is kind of loose-knit, and it's not, you know, a lot of independence in it. So they realized, okay, we got to get into all the evangelical seminaries. And they started that in the 60s in the Fuller Seminary and all the different, I, I can't remember all the names of the ones around that were, used to be fundamental Bible-believing seminaries, and now they're just radical. But here's the th thing amazing. There's only a few seminaries uh, uh, that are on a big scale in America that still believe the Bible is the inherent word of God. That's how successful they've been. It's just a handful. 90 plus percent of all our seminaries do not believe. They think, oh, the Bible's a good book, but it's got a lot of problems, a lot of errors, a lot of things. So that, that's why you're seeing that, because all those pastors, especially every new pastor that comes out, the young ones, they're radicals, because that's all they've been taught in those seminaries now is Marxist philosophy as if it's what Jesus would have done. And it's a total lie, of course, but it's powerful because they use propaganda and brainwashing and guilt and emotions to convey things. Not facts, not truth, not history to give a barometer. So it's, it's all manipulation, but the kids are ripe for it because that's how they've been taught their entire life, just by emotions and by, not by here's the facts. And I'm gonna show you, here's what this side believes and here's what this side believes. And that's why, and this is why this side, they're never taught any of that. It's just, here's, here's the, you believe this. Anyone that doesn't is evil. And the kid's like, well, I don't wanna be evil, so I'll believe this. So, so they've all been set up for the fall by the way the school system is, because Marxism got into the schools many, many decades before it came into the churches. And so that's why it's just, it's destroying the churches in America. It's hard to find a good one, but I know there's got to be a good one there. So you need to take the time to go visit different ones. And, but you cannot stay in a church when you know it's no good. You can't do that. I know you, oh, I've been here 30 years. I don't care. That's one thing you can do for the cause. 
to have your tithes and offerings being propping up something that's hurting other people is the exact opposite of Christianity. We're supposed to be loving our neighbor. And the most loving thing you can do on this earth, you know what it is? Speak truth. <laughs> that, and that, what they've told us the exact opposite. When you speak truth, that's evil. <laughs> and no, it's loving. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's the most loving thing you can do. And when you have the truth, you can always say it lovingly because the truth is what's powerful. The truth pierces them through. You don't need to get mad or have emotions or all that stuff. You just say, here's the facts. Have you seen this? You know, and so. Um, I don't know if I'm like, just ask the question or is there something? Okay, if there's something she's supposed to hang on to the oh, microphone. Okay. I know she's trying to. All right. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask, I know you, uh, one of your agenda weeklies, you discussed it, but I think it's um, a, a strategy when we start talking about whether it's national, whether it's global, um, even on our side, we get so focused and almost drowned in the, the bigness of national politics. Um, I think, and you and I have talked about this, I think, at, at length, but um, discuss um, the, the importance of trying to figure out what's going on in our state, in our cities, in our communities and basically the, the, the local focus that it's going to require for us to succeed. Thank you. W wonderful. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the reality is, I think, as we've seen, short of a miracle, th there's never going to be 50 United States of America ever again. It's not happening. <laughs> okay, just reality. So the state... And Alabama is a good state. I moved here just because Alabama is a good state. But we need to keep it a good state. <laughs> no, I did because I said, I want to raise my children somewhere where we can stay put. And we lived in Colorado for a while, but then it just got swept away by the liberals and in different places. So I was like, I want to move somewhere that, and it has some of that Bible belt in it. So there's some conviction of truth through the Bible is still respected so you can it can use that uh, which you need to be able to but so so all of you fighting for Alabama doing the things Becky tells you hey you ought to do this you got to do it and you got to get others to do it get those that are like-minded make sure they're being active it doesn't take very many people being active to make a huge difference if that one of those representatives gets a couple hundred phone calls or, or emails in one day from different people that are all they're they're gonna whoa we better do something here um, and uh, so, so or calls and things it makes a difference but then even Wetumpka, and I don't know if you're all from here, but whatever city you live in around here, what, at the local level, what can you do? City council, the sheriff, the, the, being involved, having a study group in your home. That's what I encourage people on Agenda Week. I go, have like-minded family and friend over once a week. Watch Agenda Week. I'll get, I give you every week brand new content of things to talk about and think about so you can build strong friendships. Do you understand when you, when you talk about the meaningful, you build strong relationships? When you talk about the meaningless, you feel like you're good friends, but you're really not. Because you don't, you, you've not talked about things that are deep and meaningful. And so it's a good way to build strong relationships. I've had, I, I had some couples in England that listened to Agenda Week and they go, it's been the best thing for our marriage. And I, they emailed me this long thing, they go, we talk about meaningful things now. We've just seen our marriage get so much stronger. We used to just talk about nothing, and now we're talking about issues, and we just feel so close. Thank you so much. I'm like, that's I never thought of that, but wonderful. Good, well, let's save the marriages. Um, so, so, yeah, so at the local level, being involved with groups, because a group can be much more effective than individuals. So you want to look for as many like-minded groups as you can be involved in with the time you have to... to, to, to Coordinate your efforts, your talents, your abilities in a strategic, purposeful way so you can have the most effect and the most influence. And you need to get strategic. Um, yeah, I've got good stories on that. I know we're running out of yep. time. We've got another question here. Go ahead. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Mr. Bowers, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you coming so that uh, we could hear what, uh, your, your ideas. Um, I'd like to ask you about a half a dozen different questions, but I know that I'm limited on time. 
And so I'm going to pick your favorite. Ma'am? Pick your favorite. Your favorite question. I'm going to, I'm going to give him my favorite. And uh, based on what I've seen since the 60s, I am absolutely convinced that the communist, socialist, left-wing movement in this country is not going to quit until they have won. And, and if I am correct, then the only way, then, then that means that liberalism, socialism, etc., cannot coexist with a free market capitalistic economy. Um, I think some of the things we can do in hopes that that doesn't happen is, and I encourage people this everywhere I speak, is to get to areas, get to states that are more conservative minded so you're around like minded people and even with what's going on in Florida, they're doing some good things in some different states. Here's the blessing of, what, of Biden and all of them just pushing things 100 miles an hour. The blessing is the harder they push it, the more it's going to wake more people up. Like, whoa, what? They're taking the guns now? They're doing, you know, and that's good. I, I, I pray God, God, if they're to come to power, help them to go in their pride, go so fast, it awakes every last person that would ever be finally fed up with something to be awake and to be willing to act and do something. Um, and I don't know if we even got a, a you know, a group of states to, to, to kind of break off in a thing where we're, we're separate and we're, we're doing things this way. We're sticking with the Constitution. You can do your own things. We're not. Somehow there has to be some, that's what I was kind of talking about a little bit ago. There's not going to be 50 United States. It's just not happening. So can we all congregate together in states where we have, you know, 60, 65, 70 percent of the population that wants freedom. They, they want to do, they want to make America great again. They, they, they do believe in the founding principles. And then try to get where we start saying, this is what something I would love for Alabama to do. Maybe if you have influence with any representatives. A couple years ago I thought about this. Here, this is a key thing. Whatever your state you're in, and we're in Alabama, we need to make it a sanctuary state for everything we believe in. The left has already proven you can ignore federal law, you can ignore everything and just say, we're, we're going to have drugs, even though that's a federal crime to have drugs. We're going to have illegals. It's a federal, you know. So they've set the precedent, which is wonderful. Well, we need to say, and we need to get that for representatives and governors saying, Alabama is a sanctuary state for life. You do an abortion, you're going to prison. We could care less what any court says about it. We could care less what any Supreme Court says about it. We are a sanctuary state. We were a sanctuary state for the Second Amendment. You will not infringe on any of our rights for any reason, under any circumstance, because they're from God and you have no authority. You're outside your jurisdiction and Alabamans are not putting up with it. And you just, we just make a bill of rights for Alabama, which is just our constitutional bill of rights. But see, these are Alabamas. We believe what the declaration said. These are God given. So no politician, no crisis, no anything can make us ever infringe upon these rights because they're from God. And, and, they cannot, and, and we just, we got to get press, press these representative centers that are so pathetic, most of them, I just know them because they're all the same at the federal level, the state level, and we have to put pressure on them. Are you for making Alabama a sanctuary state? If you're not, you need to get out because we're going to run someone against you and we're going to get you out because we love Alabama and we love the God-given rights that, that he gave us and we're keeping them. We're not losing them. And I think even as the state stood up like that, where you had a state, just one state standing like that, all of a sudden it sets up the parameters where it's making them, if there's going to be an engagement, it's them, they have to come against you, where you're just defending yourself. You're not, hey, we're not doing anything, but you're attacking us for standing up for our God-given rights. And that's the position you want to be in. You don't want to be uh, whatever. But anyway, that's a tough topic as you probably as you were hearing that ask, it's a tough one to deal with how to say that, how to do that. But anyway. Okay, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna end it right here. Okay, what last question. Short. Yes. You know I'm a stickler on this time. What do we do in Alabama to get rid of Common Core? We've been fighting it for over ten years. 
Good job. What's it's a, yeah, it says you, you the, the home school home school pull them out. Pull that, them out. That's the, yeah. I mean, no homeschool is the best. A lot of people oh I can't do it. You might be able to do it if it was important enough. I'm just that's what we got to start getting the young parents. Do you know how much you your kids how it, it's just such a wonderful thing. The main reason I homeschool it wasn't for the education. It was for the relationship. I said, I want my kids to think, to know dad, and, and where he is their father, but they admire him more than anyone else, and they've learned more from him than anyone else. So they would think of me as their teacher and as their pastor when I'm teaching the Bible home. So they would come ask me the tough questions. I go, I don't want you going off to ask someone. I'm your father. I love you more than anyone. You have a tough question. Ask me. We can talk about anything, anytime, anywhere. I want you to be wise. I want you to have understanding. And so, but that takes commitment. And where you're like, I used to be a great golfer. I've played one time in 25 years because I said, I don't have time for that. I want to raise the next generation to love and fear God, to keep his commandments and to love their neighbor as themselves, which means they're going to stand for the truth because that's the most loving thing you can do. And that's not going to happen by accident. And it might not even happen with my work, but God, would you bless us, please? I'm still in the middle of it. We'll see how it turns out. But I like my kids, and uh, they're neat kids. And, but, but I'm working on that and praying about it. God, help me, because it's a huge task. But that's the bottom line, because I don't care if Common Core's in there or not. It's the, the whole the age-segregated peer grouping. Do you know who that came from? Do you understand? It's Karl Marx again. He said you have to age segregate, peer group the children so you can brainwash them. If you have the different ages in a classroom, you can't brainwash them because the older kids will see what you're doing. This is Marxism, even that. And we've even done it in our churches. All the third graders go here, all the fourth. Dividing off the ignorant where they just hang around the ignorant and you separate the wisdom from them. So of course they're going to be ignorant. Of course they're going to be a fool because they've hung around fools their whole life. It, I'm just telling you, it, this is a key point, and I, I know we're unloading a lot on you tonight, but listen to me. If you, the Bible says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. That's why we're losing our children. They're never around wise people. When I go to a church and I see there's a senior class and a young marrieds, I go, what are you doing? These should be combined. The, and I, and I, they had me speak at some churches in the young married class. And I said, the first thing you need to do is find a couple that's been married 30 plus years. And those are your best friends. Don't have best friends, some ignorant person like yourself. When you both ask each other questions, you don't know what's going on. What do you do about this? I don't know. What do you do about this? I don't know. Why don't you ask someone that knows? And they can be, and you can have a friendship there that's valuable and meaningful. And you learn and you appreciate those even more. And then it gives the people that are a little bit older, like all of us, a place to impart our wisdom. I mean, it's wonderful. I love when a young person asks me something. I'll sit there in my church. That's all I talk to. I'd hardly talk to someone my age. I go, I want to influence the next generation. So I'll sit down at the table. We have lunch after church with the high school kids. Hey, what's going on? And start grilling them with questions or have them grill me with questions because I want them to become wise. And you cannot become wise inside a vacuum of age segregated peer grouping, which makes you vulnerable and then it makes you a slave, last point, it makes you a slave the rest of your life to pressure where you'll submit. Facebook bans your post. Oh, I better not do that anymore. It makes you so ripe to be whipped around because you're, you've been pressured. I remember going to elementary school growing up. And I was in a Christian one. I remember the teasing and the, where you just, I was a quiet kid, so I just would be quiet because you don't want to get bullied and teased and whatever, because that's the way, when you age segregate peer group, you know what happens? There's a vacuum of authority. So a bully is going to rule every time. Every time the bully's rising to the top when you age segregate peer group. So you're going to have the little quiet kids being the ones that they're teasing you about your shoes or your whatever. And it starts to teach you just do whatever everybody else is doing. Because I don't want to be different in any way, shape, or form. Because I don't want to be teased. It's too painful. I don't want to do this. And that's all that's doing. And the high colleges, the high schools, and churches. And it's not working. We've been doing it now since John Dewey in the 1930s. We've been doing it for 90 years. And it hasn't worked. The one-room schoolhouse worked. <laughs> 
because you had the different ages for accountability. The older kids could help the younger kids with their homework so they would get real life experience on helping. That's what homeschooling is great. My two oldest girls, they just taught all our younger ones how to read, how to write. How, so they just became experts in those things because when you teach it, you have to know it. If you're going to teach math, you have to be really good at math. And so it makes you do that. So that, you know, anyway, I'm sorry, that's one of my hot buttons, as you can tell, <laughs> because I think it is the way God designed things to be. And she's just on edge because she's a time person. Yes. And I went over. No, I'm sorry. We are right. It is Thank eight you for being here. Right now. Um, I would, I hope that all of you, I know you got several things out of this, so give Curtis a great hand. <laughs> I have, I have one favor, two favors I'd like to ask. Please check out agendaweekly.com. It is so worth it. Even if you don't have, I listen to the podcasts there once a week. They come out on Saturday mornings. I listen to them in the car. You can watch them on video if you want, but I just, when I'm driving to Montgomery, I just throw it on and it, you will learn so much. And then there is also a 10 steps or, you know, he'll have notes in there at the end of things that you can do or hype best articles of the week, please go there. The other thing, Eagle Forum has started small groups across the state. And in the, in the coming emails, please go to our emails. If you're not, fill out the forms in the back. Um, we will begin putting a little blurb in there that if you're interested in, to, in getting into a small group, we'll have a place for you to click. And we're, we have groups starting all over the state. And Lori is starting. Your children, your grandchildren, send them to Teen Eagles. I'm starting groups all over the state. You can reach the young people and make a difference. Thank you. And Lori will be out there. So I would really appreciate if you would do those things. And stay tuned for the next meeting. And Eric is pointing at me. Eagle Forum, uh, alabamaeagle.org. We have a donation bucket out there. We would love for you to just drop a little something in. Please buy something from Curtis's um, table also. He's got books. He's got videos. Sign up for the, his emails also. Any last words? Don't be discouraged because discouragement makes you want to give up. And we are accountable to stand for the truth even if there's no success. We, God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because we did what was right. It doesn't matter if it's successful. God's the one, like I said, he's the one that parts the Red Sea. But we need to hold up the staff. And nobody's been holding up the staff. He's the one that takes our little nothing loaves and fishes and feeds the 5,000. He can do it, but you need to give it to him. <laughs> if you just keep your little nothing to yourself, it'll be nothing. But you give it to him, he'll multiply it out and pray, God, would you bless my efforts? I know they're nothing, but you are something. And do it. That's what he's done with this film. We've had over 25 million people just online watch that film. We may, I'd never made a film in my life. When we finished it, it won the largest cash prize film festival in America. I'd never made a film in my life. Didn't know anything about it. And we sat down as a family the day we finished it and said, God, we're giving you our loaves and fishes. Please do something. We lived in Idaho in the middle of nowhere. We thought, how are we going to get this out to anyone? I mean, we were so glad to be done. It was a two-year project, but, and he said, I'll take care of that. And he did. Had it win a film festival and all these other things. It's in other languages now also, isn't it? It's in tons of other languages. And it, here's what's neat. I, I just found this out a month ago. Um, a, a TV station from Brazil was interviewing me. I was like, why do you want to interview me? I mean, I was curious. Like, they said, because of agenda. And I said, do you know about agenda? You speak Portuguese. And they said 10 years ago, and I, Professor so-and-so, I can't remember his name, he's one of the top professors in Brazil, he had emailed me, and I remember this happening, but I didn't know what happened. Can I use, can I translate agenda into Portuguese? Because the same thing's happening here. And he did, and he, this guy told me, he goes, he made hundreds of thousands of copies and gave it to every church in the Brazil, the entire country, and that's why we have a Christian president now is from Agenda. And I was like, <laughs> and I was just like, you're kidding. But see, see, I didn't do that, but God did that. 
That's why you got to give him your little nothing, because it's nothing. I have nothing, you have nothing, we all have nothing. But he loves using nothing to do something, because then it's clear who did it. <laughs> and so that's, that just don't forget that. You be encouraged, and when you get overwhelmed, get on your knees. God help us. He loves you if you're one of his children. And he, we know from Sodom and Gomorrah, he would have spared those two huge cities destruction they deserved if only ten righteous people would have been there. That's how much he loves his children. And there's way more than 10 righteous in America. I've got 11 in my family. So I've prayed many nights, God, you spare America for my family. You did, just, we don't deserve it, we don't, but you can do it. I'm asking you to do it, to show the world how powerful you are and you change things because of that's who you are. And he loves righteousness. And so I know it's a, it's a right prayer. He will do what is best always because he is God. But we need to trust in him. Amen. And with that said, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next time. Drive safely.